Welcome to part two of our discussion with Rex Davidson, OEM co-founder and president. Um, so let's move on to a little bit of a different subject. And one thing that's always been kind of, it's always been asked of me and it's always been kind of confusing and I'm not sure I fully understand it. But talk to me about the difference between a hydrostat drive and a direct drive, benefits, features, um, I know you're, you're hydrostat, but why did you choose to go hydrostat? What are the advantages of that? We have, uh, you know, in, in the very initial concept of our equipment, we use some hydrostats and, um, we got a lot of, we got really good controllability. Um, we did it because that's, that's just the first thing that came to our mind. And, and later on, we thought, you know what, these, uh, these gear pumps are, extremely inexpensive you know you're talking a 300 dollar pump versus a two thousand dollar pump and so um we had an issue with controllability um that we we even went to some really high-end valving to try to steer them you know with the gear pump scenario you are actually uh providing X amount of oil that has to be pumped through a valve and you control how much oil goes to that wheel motor for driving purposes. Uh, and you control that through a valve, and, you know, and so trying to limit the amount of oil that's going to drive the machine forwards, backwards, left and right in a skid steer fashion is, uh, especially on a battery machine, um, we found that they were too jerky. And if you are somewhere between a stopped position and a full forwards position, if you're anywhere in between, then you're actually pulling more amperage on the motors. You know, you're actually requiring more horsepower to drive it slow than it did to drive at full speed because you're sending a lot of oil back to the tank. So we, we have tried and you know, spent literally hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop things with the gear pump that was drivable as it would be with a uh, hydrostat. And we can't get there. We cannot get there and get it something that's acceptable to my customers. Uh, we've tried it and we get a, we get a thumbs down from our customers. You know, that's, that's not going to cut it. Uh, go back and try it again. Fortunately for us, we do have customers that do have a very loud voice and, uh, you know, they they use the right words to get me motivated to make a machine that is drivable. Like, you know, like our twister, our twister is absolutely the most drivable machine out there on the market. Uh, so whenever you have a customer that's used to driving that twister machine with the drivability it has, and they buy a, a uh, less expensive, uh, smaller machine from you they want that same performance and drivability well and that's one thing i've always heard about the oem scrapers is they drive like cadillacs you know they are very smooth um very operator friendly and more when it comes to training a new operator you know if you get on one of these machines for the first time um i i've i've heard that people can just it's like a duck to water they get to it very quickly they're driving around edges and walls with no problem at all with some of the other machines, there's a learning curve because they are so jerky and you have to learn to adapt to that. Um, so I'm assuming you give, contribute that to the hydrostat drive. The hydrostat drive is what they use on nearly every, well, I'm going to say nearly every zero turn mower in the turf industry utilizes a hydrostatic transmission. And part of that is because, uh, you know, you can run a couple of big uh, 20 gallon a minute pumps and use a very small hydraulic tank, um, you know, and whenever you're looking at these machines, you're trying to uh, fit a lot of stuff in a small enough package you can drive through a doorway and get into an office. So if you can get away from using a 20 gallon tank and use a three gallon tank, that's what I'm going to go for. Um, as far as drivability, if you have the right operator, they can make anybody's machine perform extremely well. I've had a guy come in there with hands as big as baseball mitts and drive an old, an old ancient archaic primitive machine with the uh, four cylinder Nissan engine on it and uh, valve controls and educate me really quick that those machines can be operated in a extremely smooth manner, um, embarrassingly smooth manner. 
But if you throw, like you said, if you throw a new guy on, on one of those machines, he better have a seat belt and a rodeo hat on because it's going to be a, a fun day for him. Uh, so throw that same guy in one of our machines with a 50 horsepower, 60 horsepower engine, rev that engine up to full RPM, and he can write his name in the floor with it. Um, we have just, you know, on, on our side, we've just chosen to use the most efficient pump for the dollar and the most efficient pump and, and steering mechanism to give the, the, the guy the controllability. There's a lot of things out there that you have to drive the machine around and be careful. Um, a lot of guys would, would assume we're, we're all working in Walmarts where you got 30, 40, 50,000 square feet of open area. That's never the case. You've got bookshelves and, and, toilets and sinks and things that you've got to work yourself around things in the floor you got to work around so drivability is is of utmost concern also there's that that moment when you're driving it on a trailer up in a trailer on a ramp and so you need to have controllability in that um next subject is torque that's a subject that i've never fully understood i've heard people talk about torque um they use that as, almost as an excuse for slower machines, but we create more torque. So therefore our plowability is greater. Um, talk to me about torque. What exactly does it mean? Where is it generated from? And is it really a viable term that we should be using when it comes to floor scrapers? We've done a lot of calculations. <clears throat> we use a couple of different sizes of wheel motors and, and uh, although torque is a concern, um, the amount of torque that it takes to spin the tires, you know, on a broom finish concrete in my parking lot, I can spin the tires on any machine and pumping about 2000 PSI at 2000 PSI on any one of my machines. We're looking at about 600 foot pounds of torque maximum. Every one of our machines, with the exception of the twister, is putting out 730 pound, foot pounds of torque. <clears throat> That's more torque than a power stroke diesel. So it's way overkill. If you want to utilize more torque, stop the tires from turning. How do you stop that? You add more weight. How much weight can you put on the back of one of these lightning machines? I mean, you start adding weight to the back, and then that relieves weight off the front end. So you got to add weight to the front end, keep the front end under the tile. So we have matched that uh size and weight proportionally to give you the right amount of weight on the tires and the right amount of weight on the blades so the only way to utilize more torque is to add more weight okay now the uh, twister machine at 4400 pounds we've got about a thousand foot pounds of torque and we also have the speed so yeah if you want to make the machine go faster you're going to lose you know and you continue to have the same amount of horsepower uh, you know, our, our battery machines are running, a, you know, about maximum horsepower available, about 20 horsepower. So if you, uh, if you want to utilize every bit of that and make the machine go faster, now you're going to lose torque. If you want to make the machine have more torque, uh, you have to go slower. So again, if you want to utilize that torque, you got to add more weight. Okay. Let me give you a hypothetical. I'm a, a brand new contractor to the industry. I'm coming in from a, a, another industry and I've seen guys make boatload of money doing flooring removal and I want to get in, but I know nothing about it. Uh, I look at the various websites, the manufacturers, and there's a, a full array of, of scrapers. Um, how do I know which one I need? Um, are certain machines made for specifically for certain applications, whether it be soft goods or hard goods? Is there a hybrid machine that can kind of do a little bit of everything? I guess my question is, why are there so many machines and what's the, the specific use of each one? Most people are shopping price. Um, they want to get the, the least expensive machine to do literally everything they can do. Um, we have an array of, of, of customers. Um, you know, right now in 2021, the most of the customers that we're dealing with, they're doing a very large amount of uh, VCT tile, VAT uh, tile, things like that. So literally any machine that we produce is going to be very efficient at doing any of that. And so with 
you know, the, the high capacity, you know, we're talking targets, Walmarts, um, things like that, where, you know, we're, we're looking at some pretty soft stuff there, but they want, they need high production and they're going to, they're going to run the machine for a few hours. And so for them, um, from what we've experienced, they're doing multiple stores at the same time. They, each one of these contractors have got maybe five and, and up to 80 or 90 crews working at the same time. So are they going to buy a twister at $48,000 or are they going to buy a couple of lightnings? They're going to run it for two hours on a the job. They're going to throw a 2,500 pound machine in a trailer and along with all their other tools, or are they going to throw a, a 4,500 pound machine in that same trailer and, and it may not have the weight carrying capacity. So that's a very simple question to answer on that customer. So you're going to sell them a machine that's going to do the job, no matter what machine they buy, it's going to do everything they want it to do. And maybe you wonder if they're doing the entryways to those Walmarts or those targets that has a little bit of uh, ceramic tile. It may not blow it out as fast as a twister, but it's going to get the job done. Now, if you were talking to a uh, demolition contractor who is doing largely the toughest stuff because the demolition contractor gets called whenever nobody else can get it done. So they're looking at a twister because they're being asked to come in and do some of the tough ceramic tile, uh, maybe the thin set removal and things like that, or maybe a hurricane. But the, the economics of it is one of the leading factors of the different machines and then the okay are we going to be doing offices if we're doing offices we're looking at you know possibly some pretty good uh stuff to take up as like a double stick so is a hurricane going to be what we're going to use probably or maybe one of the battery machines because we're working in an environment where we may have an occupied uh office next door or something okay um, let's get back into the design of, of OEM products um, versus competitors. Your front end has a very unique look to it. Um, explain a little bit why you decide to go with the front end you have versus some front ends that some of the competitors have. We Our original design was um, uh, promoted at that time because there was a patent on a round shaft and a round pipe and allowed the blade to form to the floor. Uh, we, we figured out really quickly on the first design of a machine that our, our frame was just completely rigid. So if you had a 24 inch blade on the front of that machine and you ran over some of your debris, the machine would tilt over to the side and lift the blade out of the flooring. And so you had to back up, clear some debris out of the way and, and hit it again. So we uh, you know, in 98, whenever we started building equipment on our own, we, uh, needed a way that the machine would twist to the floor. Uh, the, the body, the frame, the undercarriage would twist while driving forward, which is why we developed the twister. And, uh, so the, the blade bar assembly would allow us to lift and lower the carriage, the blade arms. And then it was a, a, another set of cylinders that would allow us to change the pitch where maybe some of the competitors are using one mechanism to do both. And uh, so we, we designed that, we patented that, and uh, we've been doing that for, for almost 20 years now. But since then, that patent has expired and we've started employing some of the more simple round shaft in a, in a pipe mechanism to allow some of our tooling to twist on the floor and keep it engaged underneath the flooring. But uh, one, of the, one of the things that we have uh, tried to make certain on each machine throughout, whether it's the twister action or it's the uh, shaft and pipe mechanism, is to keep that blade as close to the machine as possible. The farther you drive that blade out in front of the machine, the less weight is, a, is gonna be on the blade. So, I mean, uh, let's just take one machine in particular, um, like a hurricane. If you 
weigh, and we did, if you weigh the amount of pressure that is on that blade versus the amount of pressure that's on the, the wheels, it may be 12 inches behind it, closer to underneath the machine, there's a 400 pound difference. So if you move that blade farther away from the machine, <clears throat> yes, it is effective to get underneath things. And it is a little bit more pleasing to the operator to have it farther away from you to see it versus craning your neck down a little bit to see your blade on one of our machines. The effectiveness of the machine's weight to be properly placed right over the blade and on the blade itself it's it's uh, it's what makes ours uh, more effective in some of the, the tougher applications. This concludes episode eight in a series of podcasts focusing on the basic principles of concrete surface preparation. Make sure to join us for episode nine, our final episode with Rex Davidson, where we extend our conversation to include the importance of proper blade selection, as well as other critical information every floor scraper owner should know. For immediate access to hundreds of industry tutorial and product demonstration videos, we invite you to visit the Buy Manufacturers Direct YouTube channel. Simply visit the Buy Manufacturers Direct homepage and click Watch More Videos. New videos are added weekly, so don't forget to subscribe and click that bell icon to be notified when we post a new video.